Thank you so much for being with us. We are very honored to be with all of you tonight for this very special event. Karis Books and More and the Auburn Avenue Research Library on African American Culture and History welcome Charlene Hunter Galt in conversation with Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal for a celebration and discussion of my people, five decades of writing about black lives. From the legendary Emmy Award winning journalist, a collection of groundbreaking reportage, <coughs> excuse me, reportage from across five decades, which vividly chronicles the experience of black life in America today. We welcome Charlene Hunter Galt, who is an Emmy Award winning journalist. She began her career at The New Yorker, becoming the first black reporter for the talk of the town section. Then she, from there, she joined The New York Times, where she established the Harlem Bureau, the first of its kind. She eventually joined PBS NewsHour as its first substitute anchor and national correspondent. She is the author of five books, several of which are available now from Karis out front. She lives in Florida and on Martha's Vineyard. And our moderator today is Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftal, known to folks all over Atlanta. Dr. Sheftal is a black feminist scholar, writer, and editor who is the Anna Julia Cooper Professor of Women's Studies and English at Spelman College right here in Atlanta, Georgia. She's the founding director of the Spelman College Women's Research and Resource Center, the first at a historically black college or university. Dr. Guy Sheftal has published a number of influential texts within African American and women's studies, including the first anthology on black women's literature, Sturdy Black Bridges, Visions of Black Women in Literature. So we're very excited to have this conversation today. We will invite y'all to ask questions towards the end. So you'll just queue up to one of these two microphones and we'll have time for just a few questions. So um, please sit back, enjoy, and thank you both so much for your work and for your wisdom. Thank you. Let me say how pleased I am, Charlene, to be um, in conversation with you and to be in your presence. Before I get started, I want to acknowledge the presence of our new president at Spelman College, Dr. Helene Gale. <laughs> so before we start, I want to remember our friend and comrade, Valerie Boyd, a fellow journalist to whom you dedicate my people. And this is what you said in the dedication. To the next generation of journalists who I hope will join me in fighting the good fight, and to the late Valerie Boyd, the Charlene Hunter Galt Distinguished Writer in Residence then at the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Georgia, and a multi-talented author, journalist, and friend who helped me choose students committed to giving voice to the voiceless long live. So we wanted to call Valerie Boyd's name tonight as well. That's a great thing to do. That's really great. And thank you for doing this. And thank you all for your patience. I can't even begin to tell you the things that <laughs> interrupted my getting here. But I'm here. And I'm so glad that each and every one of you, including my brother and his wife, and uh, I hope to see all of you and get your names before this is over. So thank you and on to you. All right. <laughs> In her forward to your book, Nicole Hannah Jones, who also made history recently, ends by saying, here lies the work of a woman whose, at, whose destiny would be both to chronicle history and to make it, as you surely. Let's begin our conversation with your sharing what you would consider the most important, impactful, memorable aspects of your extraordinary personal journey, which began right here in Georgia. Of course, even before your historic desegregation of the University of Georgia with your comrade Hamilton Holmes. Now, you asked me a question <laughs> that I'm supposed to remember that because I'm now 80, okay? <laughs> and I was telling Dr. Gale on the way over here, there's so many things. I don't even remember how I started this book. <laughs> but, but, but just tell us some things about your life. Yeah, no, okay. I understand. I just wanted to tell everybody that I might not remember everything. But Georgia, Covington, Georgia, where I 
spent the first uh, six years, I was six years old, I think, maybe a little bit older when we moved to New uh, Atlanta. And those were the days of segregation. And the majority, uh, the rulers, shall we say, um, had attempted to not only legally make us second class, but they tried to impact that in our brain. And what they were unsuccessful at doing, having to do, I think, with our history, going back to the time we stepped off the slave ships, and you know, Henry Louis Gates has chronicled that beautifully, they helped us appreciate who we were as opposed to what the rulers uh, were trying to keep us as, second class citizenship. And so I think what's important, and one of the reasons I did this book, is I wanted to look at how we got over. Mm -hmm. And we got over, even in the midst of some of the most horrific things that happened to us in different places in the South, those of us who survived got over because our history, and our history was our armor. And so anything could be thrown at us, but we had the armor of our history. For example, am I going on too long? Mm. <laughs> okay, because I do get started. <laughs> For example, my grandmother used to sit like you with five, three newspapers in her lap. And I would wait until she had finished, even though I was patient at five and six years old, I waited. And she would hand me the paper the, where I read the comics. And I fell in love with the comic strip character, Brenda Starr. And when I told my mother in segregated Covington, Georgia, that I wanted to be like Brenda Starr, she didn't say, oh no, that's, that's what white people do, or you know, that, that's not for you. Instead, my mother said, and I guess it was that historical instinct, if that's all she said was, if that's what you want to do. And that so inspired me. And then I went to the black, all black elementary school, the Washington Street School, where they had to raise money to make up for the deficits they suffered as a result of the failure of the white schools to treat us equally. So the, the, the parents and friends of the parents and my uncle's girlfriends, who my mother would go and find to get contributions, <laughs> they would raise money every year uh, at an event. And the one who uh, raised the most money, the family who raised the most money, would be crowned king or queen. Hey, <laughs> Stephen, doctor, <laughs> Stephen. Um, and you're not as late as we were. <laughs> well, a little bit later. <laughs> anyway, uh, this and, and the one who got crowned king or queen would get a bull of a watch and a diamond tiara. And on this particular night, I'm looking over, because we, my parents and everybody in that community was so careful. And my mother and grandmother were counting money out of their starch, linen, white, handkerchiefs. And all of a sudden I heard, and this year our new queen is Charlene Hunter. They pronounce my name right, which a lot of people don't. But anyway, <laughs> I put that crown on. I didn't really give that much about the bull of a watch. But the crown I loved. And I would wear it every day, and my friends got so sick of me. They used to tease me. They used to threaten me. If you don't take that thing off, and eventually I took it off. But the notion 
that I was the queen took up residence mm. in my head. So that when I walked onto the campus of the University of Georgia in 1961 under court order and all of the white students or many of them were yelling you know what starting with an N that rhymes with trigger, figure, whatever, go home. I was looking around for that person they were talking about because who was I? I was a queen. Mm -hmm. I was 19 years old and that had gone into my total consciousness that I was a queen. And that, is, that education was part of the armor that I have worn all my life that came from that community that they were trying to make them feel separate and unequal and they failed. They failed. And I never want to forget mm. the people who made it possible, other people who look like me. And yet they had the history too, just like today. We're trying to get the history and keep the history in our schools. No matter how much opposition there is to it, we have to keep on keeping on. All right. You have published four books prior to my people, and I want to call these titles out. And I went back and reread two of them. Mm. In my I'll give you an A. Good, because I'm, I'm a good student still. <laughs> In My Place, New News Out of Africa, Uncovering Africa's Renaissance, that's the whole title, To the Mountaintop, that's the one I reread last night. That was my, the one for children. Yes, but, but, but very smart children. <laughs> my Journey Through the Civil Rights Movement. This one I was, didn't know about, Corrective Rape, Discrimination, Assault, sexual violence and murder against South Africa's LGBTQ community. And now my people. A memoir, of course, about your University of Georgia days. That is a mountaintop. Before we focus on my people, and I'm gonna assume that many of us in the audience don't know about the South Africa one. I would love for you to share what motivated you to write corrective rape and describe what it was like living in South Africa before you moved back to the States? I like that question. Mm. Because I spent a lot of time in communities. You know, you can't just cover the politicians and the preachers. And I used to go around. Now, South Africa had a constitution that was more progressive than ours because in their constitution, which they uh, created after Nelson Mandela got out of prison and was then uh, president of the country, the, the, uh, the constitution recognized the, the importance of recognizing gay people mm -hmm. and having them have all the rights of everybody else and while they might be discriminated by people who didn't like gays, uh, they were legally legal. <laughs> they were legal. And I got to know some of them when one was murdered by some, we're not all saints, and there were black South African men who hated LBGTQ people. And so they would, in some cases, rape them and then let them go. And in some cases, they would rape them and kill them. And I think I got started on this uh, when one of the women had been murdered. And I went to the township because there, most black people were poor. Mm -hmm. And they, they lived in the townships. And sometimes, the all the time, the townships were very didn't have the same things that other communities had, resources and stuff. So I went and I talked to a number of them. I found them, I knew where to find them because I knew where the murder had taken place and that's just where I went. And, and one of them had been in a bar one night having fun 
and was on her way back to her house or wherever she lived, probably a shack in that community. And these guys approached her, raped her, and left her dead in a, in a, in a ditch. And I walked back through all of that and I found the policeman who covered that area and got them to talk about it. And I said, I've got to write about this because this is wrong. I mean, here is a, even if it happened in America, it would be wrong. But it happened in a country that recognized gay people fully. And so I wrote, the, wrote it for the New Yorker and then I was asked to convert that into a book, and I did. And I think it had some impact, but like all the discriminatory things happening still in this country, uh, it's still happening. Uh, but there's a church that they went to, if you read the piece, um, and they will recognize not as being gay, but as being members of the church. Okay. And I read recently that they're still going to that church. So some things have happened, some good things have result come about as a result of some bad things. So that's why we can't ever give up, even when we're in times like these, where we have a lot of challenges. But as, as, I, as I said, I'm 80 years old, and so I have seen challenges overcome. And yet I've seen challenges that still need resolution. You know, since, since you mentioned that and since this is gonna be on C-SPAN, we should call the name of Sakia Gunn. Young, queer, black woman, teenager who was also killed by a band of young black men uh, in New England. So it happens here too. Mm -hmm. So I wanna remember Sakia Gunn uh, in that connection. You began this amazing collection of your writings with a New York Times piece, April 1976. And Charlene has been writing over 50 years. I mean, it's really amazing. On an after school, about an after school school for black youngsters in Harlem. And you end with a New Yorker piece entitled Nelson Mandela, The Father, May 2000, near, 2013, nearly dec four decades later. In between, <laughs> there are topics and commentary too numerous to summarize, but I just want to mention a few. Martha's Vineyard, the Black Panther Party, Donald Trump, a section on my sisters, one of my favorites, of course, Malcolm X, Julian Bond, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Trayvon Martin, your reach is broad and deep. In 1970, one of the most important years in black women's history, the publication of Tony K. Bambara's The Black Woman, Alice Walker's novel, The Third Life of Grange Copeland, Audre Lorde's collection of poetry, Cables to Rage, the founding of Essence Magazine. I could go on and on. In any case, you published and I hadn't read this one before, I couldn't remember this one. In November 17, 1970, an important piece, Many Blacks Wary of Women's Liberation <laughs> Movement in the United States. And I agree with everything you said. Oh, thank you. <laughs> in which you mentioned, this, I, I like this even more, you mentioned several militant feminist black women whose names are still not well known. Frances Beale, mm. a former SNCC activist, who founded Third World Women's Alliance, an early black feminist organization that emerged because of the male-centeredness of the civil rights movement and the racism or white women's centeredness of the women's movement. You also mentioned Eileen Hernandez. A lot of folks saw Eileen's name and thought she was Latina, mm -hmm. a black woman, one of the founders of NOW that we associate with so-called second wave feminism. And of course, Dorothy Height, president of the National Council of Negro Women, the largest black women's organization, representing about, if you can imagine, four million black women and 25 black women's groups. All of this is in that essay. Mm. You also mentioned Eleanor Holmes Norton, 
and the now legendary Shirley Chisholm, the first African American, not Obama, to seek the presidency. When you think about that period in our history, the decade of the 70s, what are your thoughts now? Are you kidding? I'm 80 years old. How am I supposed to remember that? <laughs> Let me answer it this way, and don't give me an F for, okay. for, for it. But when you started talking about the importance of black women, and before you read all those wonderful names, many of whom I knew, like Shirley Chisholm and Eleanor, who was one of my dear friends, is one of my dear friends, I was working again in South Africa, which we talked about a few minutes ago. And it was shortly after Nelson Mandela got out of prison. And every journalist in the world flew in there, and so did I. And, but, but one of the things about, I think, about being a good journalist, if I could be presumptuous and call myself a fairly decent one, if not a good one, you, you, you develop relationships. So that in 1985, I went to South Africa when it was still under terrible apartheid. And then I went, I reported that. And then I went back when, when Mandela, also known as Madiba, got out of prison. As I said, every journalist in the world flew down there. They all got 10 minutes. But I made contact with those that I had been in touch with over the years, since 1985. And I said, 10 minutes? Haven't I earned a little more time than that? They said, OK, we'll give you a half hour. I said, great, great, because nobody, I think Ted Koppel, who was on, I believe, ABC, mm -hmm. uh, he got a half an hour. And so everybody there is happy to be in interviewing Nelson Mandela, but they were all journalists. So everybody wanted a scoop. So just before we started, I said, you know, Mr. Mandela, this is his first contact with journalists since he's been out of prison. He was in Twitter prison, 27 years, wasn't it? And so I said, why don't we just pause and let him have a cup of tea? They said, oh, OK, that's a good idea. They hadn't even thought of it. You know, Their idea was to get Mandela out there in front of these audiences. And so I said, let him, because I knew I had it at that point. So he sits down, finally. And I say, oh, Mr. Mandela, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I said, because for one thing, I come out of the American Civil Rights Revolution. And before I could get to my role, or anybody else's that I knew in the movement, he said, I said, I'm out of the, I came out of the American Civil Rights Revolution, and he said, oh, and he brightened up, and I thought he was gonna say, isn't that wonderful? And I said, he said, do you know Miss Maya Angelou? <laughs> now everybody wants to know what prison life was like, right, for 27 years. And I said, yes, I mean, I didn't really know her like I know you and Dr. Gale, but I knew her work. So I thought, OK, yes, I knew her, know her. He said, well, we read all of her books when we were in prison. Scoop! <laughs> it wasn't about much else, but I mean, Here's a man who spent 27 years in prison fighting for the liberty of his country. And one of the things he did, he did other things too, because they made him work and do all, and that's how he got his eyes all full of dust from having to dig stuff. But he had time, and the things he chose among them was our girl. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh goodness, I'm so glad I knew her. <laughs> But, but you know, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> you did. Your, your memory is amazing. You, she's talking about what you, your memory is better than mine. Yeah. You end uh, my people, with, before you get to the epilogue, with a really moving, loving piece on Nelson Mandela. And I, wanted, I want you to just say a little bit about 
the impact he had on you. And I also am remembering that you um, were not able to go to his inauguration because your son was graduating from Emory, Emory over there. And you said that to him, and he said, of course you should you know, go where your son, but it's clear that you, that, that, that you had a connection to him other than just journalist's subject. Right, well my husband who worked, uh, who went to South Africa to open J.P. Morgan Bank after, uh, after uh, the uh, separation had ended, and he, before, but before he went to South Africa, he was in touch with people that I knew and the end of apartheid had come, but so many of the young black people who were well educated hadn't had the experience, like those in, in economics, in the financial world. And so what he did before we even moved there was he communicated with Madiba's people. Mandela is called Madiba, mm -hmm. by, his, Madiba by most of the people who know him well, and I kind of knew him well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but he brought over, he, he, he raised the money to bring over a group of young black people in, economic, in the economic arena to help them not learn about economics because they were already educated in that regard, but to work in integrated settings so that they could be more comfortable when they went back home and worked in these settings that had been predominantly, well, been all white. And so that set him up <laughs> with Mandela. And I think that eventually when we uh, decided to move there, in a certain way we already, already had a relationship. But Madiba was so, and that was his name that everybody mm -hmm. called him, Madiba was so, shall I say, approachable mm -hmm. that he would finish a press conference and I always had something to ask him that nobody else did. So I would walk up to him and I'd say, uh, Mr. Mandelica, and he would answer me. And he had hired a woman who worked for the apartheid regime because he, you know, it's like here when people try to bring people together who have not been together, like some of the people we know today who are having issues with our history. Uh, he, would bring, he wanted to bring people together, so he hired this woman who had been in the apartheid administration. And while she was wonderful to him, I cannot take that away from her. She was not wonderful to me because he was too receptive to me whenever he saw me. For example, he had a press conference once and uh, he went on and on and on and was reading from a piece of paper. And so when the press conference was over, I went up to him and I whispered in his ear and I knew that was gonna piss her off, but <laughs> did I do that deliberately? I can't say I did it deliberately, but I knew what was gonna happen. And so I whispered in his ear. I said, Mr. Mandela, I said, you gave that presentation reading from a piece of paper. And I, I forget how old he was at that time, but maybe in his 80s. Mm -hmm. And I said, how did you manage that without glasses? He said, oh, and that's, he always started it since, oh. He said, there's a, there's a doctor, an orthopedic specialist who will do some kind of thing, I forget what you call it, but he, he would, uh, he said he, it's, they, they scrape the eye or something and they do something so that you don't have to wear glasses anymore. I'm gonna go look that up so I can next time tell it more accurately. But he said it was very simple and it's been years and I can see so well and he gave me his name and I'm looking at his assistant who hates me and she's getting so upset. But anyway, I took time to write down the name and that's why I can see you, because <laughs> I went to Mandela's doctor and got my eyes fixed, and that was what, how many years ago I was there? And I can still see 
without glasses, which at this age, I should be wearing glasses. Otherwise, <laughs> thanks to Madiba. But it was, uh, that was an interesting experience. And it, and it was, you know, because of my relationship with him, when people like President Clinton and, and people from uh, Britain and other places would come, I was always in the group. And one time, it was his 80th birthday, and they had a press conference, but they said, now, you can't ask any questions. You can just record the event. And so all of the journalists are lined up like that. The cameras are there. And Madiba finishes what he's doing over there, and then he walks past us to greet us, but to keep going. So he gets to me. And I said, oh, Mr. Mandela, how does it feel to be 80? And I'm, the person I told you about is looking at me like, mm. he said, well, and I, f I forget his exact answer. It might be in the book. But he said, it, it feels good. And then I thought, I got this going on. Now, all the other journalists are so happy because they were being obedient to the person who had set up these rules. <laughs> So they were encouraging me in their own way, I could tell. And I said, so uh, it was also his, I forget which anniversary it was with uh, Grasa Michelle, whom he had married after his divorce from Winnie Mandela. And, and I said, and so how does it feel to been married to Grasa Michelle for, I don't know, five or six years, whatever it was. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, young lady, Young ladies like yourself, or no, I mean, he may have said young people like yourself, don't ask such personal questions. <laughs> but, he's, but he said it sweetly, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Meanwhile, all of my colleagues were thrilled because they got a bite from Mandela, which they wouldn't have gotten before. And so it was uh, quite an extraordinary time. And that night there was a party, and President Clinton was there, and lots of people. And because of my husband's relationship at the bank, uh, he had a little expense money. <laughs> he did. And so we had a reception at our house. But, you know, as a journalist, I think that you maintain your, I don't say objectivity. I don't like that word. We're human. Our computers are objective, but we're not. Well, my computer isn't objective all the time <laughs> because I send emails to people and they don't get them. But anyway, um, it was, uh, you know, objective is different from understanding. And I don't know what other word you would use for it. We're not our computers. But we can be fair and balanced. I like that better than object, objectivity. Because when I first went to South Africa in 1985, just like now, in different circumstances, but I thought it was important to talk not just to the black people who were under, the, uh, under apartheid, but to the white people who put them there mm -hmm. and kept them there. So I made an appointment to see one of them. And it was a great experience because I didn't go in angry or, you know, tell me this and why do you do this and why don't you do this with pe black people? I just said, tell me a little about your life and what it's been like uh, as you have, he was a winemaker in your profession. I didn't say, and, you know, oppressing black people. No, that wasn't, I wanted to know what was on his mind because he was in a way, although he was wealthy because of the wine business, but he was also a typical Afrikaner who, who approved of and supported and lived by apartheid. I thought that was important to get out. Why are they thinking like that? And, and where is that going to lead this country which had not yet come out from under apartheid? And then he invited us to come and meet some of the other white South African winemakers. So he had a little party. We went, 
film part of it. Then everybody started getting drunk. I wasn't drinking. So, including my producer, rest his soul. Um, and they started telling what is the equivalent of the same thing they were calling me when I was going into the university. Starts with an N, rhymes with figure, trigger. In South Africa, they're Kaffirs. Mm -hmm. That's the e equivalent. And so they started telling Kaffir jokes. And my producer, who was from London, was laughing. And I knew he wasn't laughing because it was just polite. He was laughing because he was enjoying it. And I said, in the first instance, I've asked them to have a social so I can sort of get into what they're thinking about. But once that started, I said, oh my god, look at the time. I got to get back to my hotel. I wasn't going to condemn it. That wasn't why I was there. But I wasn't going to abide by it. I wasn't going to tolerate it. And so I said to my producer, who by this time is staggering because he's, you know, lit up. I said, we got to go. And we left. I say all that to say that it is very important for us to understand people who don't agree with us, especially journalists who, have to, who should be out there covering them. Like, I did a panel for Skip Gates. Uh, we do it. We did it virtually for two years, but we did it at the Old Whaling Church in Martha's Vineyard in Edgartown. And we couldn't find a conservative to talk about um, uh, this whole movement to get rid of black history. And yet, I had read in the Miami Herald a piece that a reporter had written focusing on these people who are opposed to black history in schools. And so I said, well, why don't we bring her? Turns out she's white. And that's not her position, but she's functioning as a journalist. So she came, and she was very good, you know, telling us, because the questions that I asked her were questions that she had answered or dealt with in her piece. She wasn't there to be interviewed for herself. And it turned out very well. Um, so you have to figure out ways, I think, to both talk to people, report on people, and do whatever is necessary. L like I remember Jim R Lehrer, uh, whom I worked with first at the News Hour. It was then the McNeil Lehrer Report, him and uh, Robert McNeil. And Jim used to say, if you give people good information, they will make the right decisions. And so I think we need to understand where the people who are opposed to certain things and aren't our color, we, we need to understand where they're coming from and hopefully have an opportunity to talk to them. And uh, I think that in some instances, face to face, person to person, you might make a little progress because not all of the people who are opposed to black history are old, like me. Um, and as I've looked at the crowds, they're young enough, I think, to have their minds changed if approached in the right way. And then they, hopefully, can make a difference. But I don't know if that'll happen. It's just how you treat people regardless of what their positions are, if you are a journalist trying to get good information. I don't know if I answered your no, question. You did. But you're, you're answering all my questions beautifully. <laughs> I have just a couple more before we open it up. But I want to thank you, Charlene, for what you reminded me and others about Nelson. I, Mandela, I just want to mention one thing which I did not know. Uh, at the last trial before he was found guilty of bullshit uh, <laughs> and sentenced to a life imprisonment. Can you imagine? He spoke for four hours. They asked him if he wanted to say something. He spoke for four hours. 
and only a little bit of it is uh, recorded, I think one paragraph which you have in here. Mm -hmm. And I have read that paragraph over and over again, which I'm not gonna do now. But I just wanna thank you for, for the, the way in which um, President Mandela is in your book. I just wanna thank you, and it made me want to go and read more about him, and I really wish we had that four hour speech. Well, the next person I'm gonna do a book on, I think. Because that was, that was what I was gonna ask you, what's next? Yeah. I, well, you know, the book got finished before Archbishop Tutu transitioned. That's mm -hmm. what they say in South Africa. They never say somebody D-I-E-D. They always say someone transitioned because they believe in the afterlife. So much so, and Mandela told me this, they go to the, once someone has transitioned, relatives, friends, whoever, go to the grave site when they have a problem and they talk to them about their problem. And they think that whatever comes up in their head is the advice coming from the ancestor. And so as a result, I was almost through with the book when um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu passed. So I'm gonna have to do another book so that I can include him because he is one of the giants of our time. He had the same instincts and philosophy and belief, whatever you want to call it, about all people and how there are no people you should hate, although there are some you need to work against, mm -hmm. but in a different way than just hate. And so while every now and then I get a little teary-eyed that he's not in the book like that, it's my next book when I'm 90. <laughs> So this is, this, this is my last one, and I'm, and I'm, I'm wanting to ask this because it's such a timely uh, question. You also shared with us, and, and it made me sort of sad, some of your reflections on, on your close friendships, some of whom, of course, had passed. I am thinking in particular of Dr. Kenneth Edmund, especially in light of the recent S Supreme Court ruling on Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. So can, can you talk a little bit about Dr. Edmund and your friendship with him? And, well, um, at the moment, I mean, since he passed, all the time, he and his wife and young people for children, one of whom lives here in Atlanta, um, they were always friends in, in our family. And I knew, I went through, in a dis from a distance, uh, his physical suffering and the toll that it took on his family but I also think that one of the reasons they survived it and can talk about him today without tears in their eyes or breaking down is that they appreciate what he contributed to Roe versus Wade mm -hmm. because he performed an abortion on a young woman. I think she was a teenager mm -hmm. and was late stage, I think. Huh? It was late stage. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And yet, it was important for him to do because of all of the reasons. I don't even remember if I ever knew, but I, I, I think I did. But he went to prison, mm -hmm. like Madiba did, for his beliefs, which was that abortion should be legal. If he were here today, he'd be on this program instead of me because he would be mm -hmm. criticizing the decision so far and arguing for it to be repealed. And hopefully, the young people whom he trained, whom I spoke, whom I spoke, who spoke at his memorial service, will pursue the path that he made for them and fight for what they believe is right. So that is also upon all of us. As journalists, I can't get out there and say what he might have said or what some of the other uh, activists might say, but what I can do 
is go to communities where, um, that are impacted by this decision and see how it's affecting people there. I mean, a 10-year-old child, mm -hmm. first of all, I don't know how she got pregnant. She was probably raped, mm -hmm. but at 10, I can't imagine that she would have been in a biological position to get uh, uh, pregnant, but she was. Mm -hmm. And so there are human stories that need to be told and need to be shared because I don't, well, I'm not going to go into it, but one of the things that we know and the statistics that I keep up with on a daily basis is the disproportionate impact of just about everything going on in this country on people of color. Uh, I read a story today, and I can't remember now what it was, but it was also a story that went into detail about, uh, it may have been medication or, or something that you can get if you've got insurance. A lot of black people don't have insurance. A lot of wh poor white people don't have insurance. And so, you know, there are things that need to be paid attention to today that we as journalists can do without being uh, protagonists or without being uh, taking a position. Uh, that's for the editorial writers. Um, but that's one of the issues that I think, and let me say this too, I'm encouraging, because it's already out there, younger people to know our history, especially those who are involved in um, campaigns like we see, Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and so on. One of the things I've been saying for some time now since Black Lives Matter started and they've done a terrific job at their own peril, we need a coalition of the generations. Because I don't know everything and as you've probably figured out today, you can see that I don't. <laughs> but I know a few things. I go back to John Lewis. I go back to Julian Bond, they're in the book. I go back to Shirley Chisholm and Ellen Holmes Norton Constance Baker Motley, who argued my, one of the lawyers who argued my case that ended up with Hamilton Holmes and me being integrated, uh, integrated in the University of Georgia. Well, at least desegregating it, let's put it that way, because I think there's a difference between integrating and desegregating. At any rate, we've been in a lot of places, or, or many black people have been in a lot of places that the Black Lives Matter people and others who are protesting in different arenas, we, we've sort of been there. The issues might have been a little bit different, although not a lot, because it's still racial discrimination. But we were not unsuccessful. Jo John Lewis was not unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. Julian Bond was not unsuccessful. In fact, one of the, I don't know if this piece is in there, but I remember covering him when I went to work for the New Yorker, and he had been a, congress, a congressman and, and you know civil rights movement and then political uh, involvement. And he gave a talk to a large crowd of people. And if you get the book, you can read about that. <laughs> but he said, we have made an impact nationally, the civil rights movement. Now, we have to go back home and work in our local communities. And I think that's so critical. That advice from Julian, Atlanta's Julian Bond, is so important. Because I talk to my friends, some of my friends, who are so concerned about politics, upcoming politics, and where we might be going. So I said, well, what are you doing about it? Mm -hmm. Are you out there in the street? 
Are you in Newtown, which is the predominantly black community in Florida, Sarasota, where I live part of the year? Are you in the street? Are your feet in the street? Are you talking to people about what's important about get My husband, again, am I sucking up to him right now or not? <laughs> but anyway, my husband in the campaign with Hillary Clinton was walking in one of those in the black community and he knocked on one door. Now this is after eight years of President Barack Obama. He knocked on this brother's door and he said, hello, I'm coming to you know, make sure you're gonna get out to vote. This young man said something to this effect, get out to vote, why should I vote? Ain't nothing happened for me in the last eight years. The eight years of Barack Obama, this guy, I don't know where he was getting his information, but it was wrong. And my husband spent more time talking to him than he did in the rest of his work that day. I even wrote a piece, I don't think it's in here either, for the New Yorker the day before this last election. And I talked to a group of brothers who had been in prison. Yeah, I don't think that was in there. Huh? I don't think that was in there. Yeah, and they can't vote in, in Florida um, if before five years after they've been out of prison. And so I went to this park where they hang out and sell dope and do other crazy stuff. And I approached them. One was wearing some purple boots. And I said, now, how am I going to get to these brothers whose main job out here is to sell dope? I said, oh my god, purple boots. I love purple. I'm a purple person. I'm a February person. And I love, that's purple. That's me. Blah, blah. And that opened the door. You know what? There were five or six of them. Only one of them could vote. And when I asked him who he voted for, he said, he said, well, it wasn't, it wasn't that other guy. Now, I knew who he was talking about. But that's interesting. To, that was interesting to me. I quoted him. But what that told me was that he voted for him without enthusiasm. I went down the street, talked to another brother who was painting some lady's house. Now, this is an all-black community, right? So I say to him, um, can I ask if you're going to vote? He says, no, I can't vote. I, I, I ain't been out of prison long enough. He said, but I think they got the ticket wrong. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I think the woman ought to be on top. You know who that is. And I said, OK, I'll, I'll write that down. Then I went around the corner to a sidewalk cafe where they have the best fried shrimp, if you're not on a diet, that they've ever, I've ever had. And I went back in the backyard, which he had used, it used to be a place for parties and things like that. But because of COVID, he had stopped doing that. So I said, well, look, I want to talk to you about politics. I said, uh, he said, well, I can't vote because I haven't been out. Now, he's got a very successful business. These are the kind of people who are in jail. Mm -hmm. And they come out and they set up uh, uh, businesses that are profitable and good. My brother was with me. He was, used to be Secret Service. And so he, he was anxious about me going to this park because he knew what was going on in the park. But um, by that time, he didn't feel I was you know, in any danger. So he had ordered a bunch of shrimp and stuff like that. So he's sitting there listening to this conversation and eating. And I said, well, if you could vote, who would you vote for? Guess who he said he would vote for? And I said, why? I don't know many black people supporting him. I guess everybody knows who I'm talking about. He got to be president. And he said, well, they always on him, the media, always on him about his taxes. And look at all these other people who are not paying their taxes, who are businessmen that got a lot of money, and they're not being you know, accused in the same way. He said, no, no, I, I, that's who I would vote for. I wrote the piece. Turns out the New Yorker published it. I think it's in there. 
The New Yorker published it, and as it turns out, the New, the New Yorker editor wrote me and said, I'm glad we published it because this, that's how it turned out. A good percentage of black people voted for Republicans. Yep. So, you know, that just makes our job, I won't say more difficult, but challenging. Because we have to balance what we do. And we have to do what Jim Lehrer said. If you pe give people good information, they will make the right decisions. So I, as a journalist, can't go around hating people who don't think the way I think politically, um, but I can report it and give it to the public and hope that with good information, they'll do the right thing. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> so before we open it up, I just want to say I have followed your career. Um, we're just a few years apart in age. I have followed your career since you integrated uh, University of Georgia. I you were in diapers. <laughs> no, I was only four <laughs> years younger than you. So I have followed your career. I want to just say that you are a, an amazing African-American woman. And I want to tell you finally before we open up, Valerie Board revered you. And she was so happy to, to, to have that Charlene Hunter Galt named professorship. Uh, so I just wanted to say that before we open it up. And Charlene has agreed to take a few questions. Yes, and I just have to say, I think about Valerie every Me too. day. Me too. Wrapped in Rainbows, you gotta read her book, Wrapped in Rainbows. It's one of the most wonderful, and I heard, like I told you, I live in Sarasota. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere that she Finished. came there to write the book. She so did. I am trying to find where she lived. I don't know who to ask anymore. I asked her brother and he didn't know, but he said he would try and find out. Because I want to go there and be inspired by her presence. And we should also say, of course, that Valerie edited the journals of Alice Walker, Alice Bellman's sister. And uh, that, that uh, book is out too. It's amazing. Yes. She finished it uh, before she departed. And this is an yes, amazing is. book. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're, we can take a few questions, Charlene. And if you don't mind, if, uh, tell us who you are when you stand up. I see some of my former Spelman students out there. Uh, do you, you have your hand up? I, we can't see too well. Yeah, so the light's it, pretty bright. Yeah. So you, 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 you get ready to say something? Go she ahead, has a question. Over. And tell us who you are. Mm -hmm. Right here. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know if anybody raised their hand. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren K. Clark, uh, class of 2010 Spelman College, comparative women's studies major. <laughs> so I studied under Dr. <laughs> Beverly I. Sheftal. Women's Resource Research Center was my home. And uh, speak up just a I'm also a, a journalist, mm -hmm. writer, editor, and researcher. I've been over in Egypt for over nine years. Um, back, came back. Uh, but my question was, um, you know, when it comes to journalism and the power of the Step media. Step back a little bit from your, from your mic. N not that far, uh -huh, just a little bit. Yeah, because it was much, getting yeah. muffled. Can you hear me now? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, okay. better. that's better. All right, so when it comes to the, I'll even raise my voice. When it comes to the media um, during apartheid, it played a very big role in demonizing um, particular uh, activists and demonizing you know, the union between Nelson and Winnie. Mandela, so I wanted to know if you were able to interview journalists who were who worked in the media, in the apartheid media and the papers they played out. Um, you know, I know when I was watching the uh, documentary of Winnie Mandela, one of the things that had highlighted, who was instrumental in Nelson, I mean, there would have been no uh, Nelson if there was no Winnie, you know, who really kept his name alive when he was jailed and did a lot of the activism work while he was in jail. Um, so I wanted to know if you managed to speak with personnel uh, from the apartheid regime who worked in media um, and getting their understanding about what they were told to write, how they were told to frame the narrative in order to, you know, keep certain people portrayed as the bad guys, as the bad people. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, 
I think one of the people in this book, I know, is in my sister's. Mm. And she was a judge. She, she, she started out working with local journalism mm -hmm. and local journalists in, I guess, Soweto, Johannesburg. And um, she, Tokazili Masipa, which, whose name I've probably mispronounced. Oh, yeah, Masipa. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and she covered um, the awful things that were going on in the apartheid regime uh, against black uh, people. And ultimately, uh, she got appointed to the court once uh, apartheid ended. And she had a big case that everybody was following about a, 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 a sportsman uh, who had murdered his wife. And um, that part of her life wasn't as, what shall we say, as um, great <laughs> as the part where she demonstrated to end apartheid. Um, so initially, what's her, what's her basic question? I couldn't get to uh, the bottom uh, of it. It was. Did, did you have any conversations with journalists who were covering apartheid? Apartheid. Yes. Is that, mm -hmm. is that a basically? Yeah. Yeah, but you're talking about the white uh, journalists. That, and if they had any black ones too. Yeah. Or, or okay. And repeat that? Yeah. She, wa she wants to know if you had any contact, if you interviewed, if you spoke about uh, journalists during the apartheid re regime who were actually supporting the apartheid regime. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well, there were many of those, mm -hmm. but there were also, you, you know, and, and most of the papers were, you know, controlled by that. But there were also uh, journalists who did cover apartheid in all of its awful manifestations and worked towards getting rid of it. Um, and I don't, I don't think that there were many who owned newspapers, but there were white journalists, just like in this country, there were white journalists as well as white people who supported our efforts yeah. to uh, gain our, shall we say, gain our freedom um, and, and achieve our equality. So it's just like today when people generalize about white people, white people died for us. Uh, and I don't think we should forget that. I mean, uh, there was uh, Baula Liuzo, a white woman who drove from her home somewhere in the Midwest down I think that's right, down to uh, 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 the South and work to help the civil rights, the people engaged in civil rights there and was murdered for it. And uh, Andrew Goodman and uh, James Cheney and so many white people, uh, you know, there came a time when Stokely said they all had to go, <laughs> but they didn't all go. And so I think that again, that's where our history is important so that we can not only learn from our brothers and sisters who were in the civil rights movement and leading the civil rights movement, like Dr. King, whom I met for the first time right here on Auburn Avenue. I was at UGA, I, he had come to help support the students like Julian Bond and Carolyn Long Banks and Wilma Long and others who were um, demonstrating and being arrested every day and I saw him and I rushed over and I said Dr. King, Dr. King, I'm shocked. He said before I could even say my name, he said I know who you are mm -hmm. and you, I'm, we're so proud of you and before I could follow up because that's what journalists do, somebody else was calling him and he moved on and so that's how I encountered for the first and last time uh, Dr. King, but it was such an inspirational moment because he was such an inspiration. I think I've written about the time that he was demonstrating with the students here. Yes, that's in here. Yeah, and uh, was, was arrested 
and, and taken to Reedsville Prison. And I subsequently learned from somebody who was closer to him than I was that in that car, in the, in the police car, in the back was a dog. I, I forgot what kind of dog it was, but it was a big dog who growled all the way to Reedsville lying next to him or standing and growling at him. That dog had been trained to hate black people too. <laughs> and, it, and this is interesting about our politics.